production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences. This time on Broad and High, Take a look at an exhibit that celebrates the natural world from soil to bloom. Clay is nature. The Franklin Park Conservatory is its perfect match. And spend some time with pop surrealist Cyrus Fire. While I'm painting, time doesn't exist. I don't keep clocks anywhere around me when I'm in the studio. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Manicky. You might not immediately draw a connection between ceramics and orchids, but when you think about it, clay is just a type of soil, so it seems fitting that this art form that literally molds Mother Earth shares space with the living species currently blooming at Franklin Park Conservatory. One. Um, part of art is sort of maybe stems from that sort of emotional quality and sort of like pain or sort of like political reaction. And then the other part strives to kind of replicate the beautiful experience that you get in nature. And so I think that kind of playing with that idea is really sort of exciting for us here. The Franklin Park Conservatory and the Central Ohio Clay Arts Guild came together to bring a fine ceramic art exhibition uh, to this institution. De La Naturaleza is Spanish for from nature. Clay is nature, you know, it's, it's the very ground we walk on. So in a place like the Franklin Park Conservatory that celebrates nature in all of its forms, it seems like a perfect match. With this exhibition, you know, it's really close to my heart because I've been working with clay for the last 18 years. It's a medium that demands a lot of patience and practice and almost a lifelong practice. Some of the works in here, it, it takes even somebody that understands clay to try to figure out how exactly did that happen. One of the best examples of kind of not understanding the technique is uh, Melanie Ferguson's piece, Karina's Dance. It's a, a black and red surface, and just the initial image is, is striking. It's a, it's be it has beautiful movement to it, but then when you get really close to it, you can't quite tell if the color is actually inlaid in the clay. It's a complicated surface with, with sort of a simple beauty to it. So it was really striking and that's why it became the showpiece really. Right now we have the orchid exhibition on view um, throughout the entire biomes. It's the annual show. I think the really kind of one of the most important things to realize is the diversity of orchids. Um, they're the largest flowering species in the world. They're located in every continent except for Antarctica. The plant world is so exciting because of that diversity, but sort of thinking about, you know, all of these are within the same family, but the impact that they have is completely different. But they're all, they're all related, and sort of looking at the dramatic difference that you can have, I think it sort of like almost replicates like, the, like human personalities, I think, almost in a sense, which is really kind of exciting. It's striking because of the glow, the illumination from the piece. Part of the reason it was the award winner is that it seems like such a simple concept, put light behind clay and it'll glow. But if it was easy, you would see a lot of it and we don't see hardly any of it. Eventually, clay fired hot enough will just melt into a puddle. So this is finding that exact moment where the clay starts to melt and become translucent, but not so far that it loses its shape and melts into a puddle. What we're doing is, is very artistic, but you're working with this live medium. I maybe had a plan and I had a certain orchid picked out, but last minute I get a call, the entire crop failed. So then you have to respond to that. And I feel like in any art making, you get that experience. Work for maybe hours or days or months on a piece, you put it in the kiln and then it cracks, right? And you have to respond. You know, you, you try to view that as a positive in some way. Curating an exhibition like this that's so close to my heart, 
really does give me an opportunity to interact with people that I already greatly respect the artwork that they're making and to get to know some more emerging artists. So it's been a great inspiration to see all of these pieces. Our horticulturist, um, main horticulturist that takes care of orchids and our orchid collection. I actually think he's very much like an orchid and he loves orchids. Like his sort of personality sort of replicates that, I think in a sense. I don't know if it's because of just like, they take care of them so often. I, I don't know, it, it's really interesting. Such amazing artwork. I had to, I had to be part, I had to take part. De La Naturaleza, Clayworks Inspired by Nature, is on view at Franklin Park Conservatory through March 6th, and so are hundreds of orchids throughout the conservatory's indoor gardens. Visit fpconservatory.org to learn more. Columbus artist Cyrus Fire considers himself a pop surrealist, and his work is easily identifiable by his bold use of color and illustration, as well as his notable canvas signature. But he also considers his art making a form of soul-centering therapy. He recently gave us a peek into his artistic process. There was a guy who used to come on television called Commander Mark. Hi, I'm Commander Mark. You always want to learn how to draw, right? Well, today I'm going to teach you how to draw. I'm going to teach you how to conquer that flat piece of paper and draw in 3D. I've never run into anyone, anyone else who's heard of him. Um, but for a while, he was like a hero of mine because what he would do is he would stand next to this huge piece of paper and he would make this like space scene of these little creatures and he would make up little habitats. They would have like little geometric homes and things like that. And I thought it was amazing because he would present it to the camera as though he was just thinking it up out of his mind. And he would do it in ink. And it would blow my mind that this guy had his own show freestyling things out in ink on public access television. And so I was like, he's awesome. And I wanted to be like him. So I used to like practice with markers and pens and stuff, but I was never good enough to not make mistakes. And then one day the camera got too close to the paper and I saw that it was all drawn out. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, no. I was way more motivated by wanting to be that dude in reality than to, uh, to, to be the guy who's faking it on TV. So I was inspired, but in the wrong way. <laughs> I got, I got pulled aside when I was younger to be a therapist at school for other kids. So uh, they wanted me to be a student counselor and I was dealing with my own stuff and I didn't think I could help other people, but they really believed I could help other people. So that is a good reason why I paint is to deal with my own stuff and like as long as my hands are busy. Uh, everything is a lot easier to deal with because I'm making progress in some way. Like every painting is basically a short-term goal achieved. I want to say if anything, people know my work by the palette. Um, but at the same time, I've also had people tell me that I have my own style because I have at least five different ways that I approach painting. So to me, there really is no style. Like my style is no style. A lot of people know that I do freestyle painting or I just make things up as I go along and I don't know basically what the end product is going to be. But I'm also an illustrator and I love comic books and I love cartoons and I love music and so anything that, that makes me happy and spurs me to paint, uh, I do it. Um, life is mistakes and painting is very much metaphorical for me and like, I'm gonna make mistakes. It happens and you can see it in the time lapse video. I changed my mind a few times. Um, there are faces in the eyes of the time lapse painting and those faces change like eight times.
I also put my signature probably five times too big in my paintings. So it's not necessarily difficult to tell some of them are mine. <laughs> um, but my friends gave me a hard time when I was younger, uh, when I first started painting, about not signing my paintings at all. So it was sort of a joke to sort of billboard my name in painting. <laughs> I have uh, black books, sketchbooks. It used to be a goal of mine to fill them up with images and I'd get a new book every year. That Morningstar piece comes from a piece that I did in Markers and I originally did it probably in 1993. I decided to produce it as a larger painting. That's what my sketchbooks were originally for is if someday my ideas dry up that I can sort of go back to a time when I felt more able to express myself freely and non-judgmentally and pull from that and then work from that until I work myself out of whatever funk I may happen to be in at the time. I guess if I just describe myself as an artist I would describe myself as an escape artist. I don't I don't really paint for the sake of showing in galleries or getting a commission necessarily. Like I absolutely like getting paid for what I do and I've been blessed to be able to have that happen and have people seek me out to do things for them. Um, but it's really about getting, getting over my own stuff and like progressing with something that I enjoy doing. Because while I'm painting, time doesn't exist. I don't keep clocks anywhere around me when I'm in the studio. I like to be able to lose myself in it and it's literally just a way to get away from things. You can keep up with Cyrus by following him on Twitter and Instagram. This next segment sheds new light on a painter who is perhaps the least known of the 19th century French Impressionists. Gustave Caillebotte ran in the same circles as Degas, Monet, and Renoir, but his contribution to the art scene went overlooked until nearly a century after his death. Here's why. Gustav Kaibat was an Impressionist painter, which is to say that he participated in the Impressionist exhibitions, which occurred between 1874 and 1882. He was considered to be the leader of the movement for several of those years. He was younger than Monet and Pizarro and Sisley and Cezanne and Renoir, but he brought a very sort of particular kind of vision to the movement. He dies young, and he is independently wealthy. And so he doesn't sell his work during his lifetime. And there's really not much of a market immediately after his death in 1894. His pictures remain in his family for about a century. And then they start to, to come out in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. There are still not many paintings by Kaibot in public collections. Because he was wealthy and didn't have to sell his paintings, Kayabat has never captured the popular imagination, as did his peers, such as Monet and Renoir. But he recorded a moment in time when Paris was undergoing a rapid transformation from a medieval warren of narrow streets to the grand boulevards it is known for today. He is responding very directly to what's going on in Paris this extraordinary new urban landscape that has been essentially constructed during his young lifetime, so across the 1850s and 60s. Bringing together 55 works from collections around the world, this exhibition expresses the beginning of modernist painting. His first ambitious painting is the floor scrapers, or Les Raboteurs, and he submits it, because he's on the track to be an artist, to the Salon. sweaty, hot, boring, difficult work. There's a gigantic bottle of wine that's opened to the side of one of them. It's, um, they're gonna drink their way through it. 
Class tensions are running high in Paris at the time, and the Salon is not ready for a stark, off-kilter look at the laboring classes. The Salon rejects the painting. So he takes that picture the next year and hangs it with the renegade group known as the Impressionists in 1976, and it causes a huge um, response. But it is Kayabat's next work that will prove to be his most acclaimed. Ignoring the bright palette of the other Impressionists, he portrays the city of light in an unidealized way, overcast and drizzling. He exhibits Paris Street Rainy Day in the third Impressionist exhibition. And it's big, and he knew that it would make a major statement, and it did, and it's all critics talked about. The umbrellas are fantastic, and they're utterly uniform, because everybody has gone to the department store and bought their black umbrella imported from the UK. There's a wonderful group of portraits. These are pictures of his friends, of his buddies, the people he hung out with. They're really portraits of, of his social milieu, um, that great painting of the guys playing cards in his apartment that he shared with his brother in his bachelor pad. There's an amazing group of still life paintings of things that he would have seen in his very fancy neighborhood in the 9th arrondissement on the sidewalks in the fancy uh, fruit and vegetable and butcher stores. The one that is taking, literally taking people's breath away is the butcher uh, shop picture from Chicago called Calf's Head and Ox Tongue, which is a, um, a pretty gory uh, example of contemporary um, industrial butchery and I think one of the most amazing still lifes of the entire century. He plays with space in almost every one of his canvases. It was something that intrigued him and that he turned in an expressive way to get at a particular kind of emotional, psychological tension. was rich and supported his fellow painters. Because he loved what they were doing, he bought their work and ended up with one of the greatest private collections of Impressionism. Today, beyond his contribution as a benefactor of other Impressionists, Kayabat is being reevaluated as an important painter in his own right for the way he captured the moment Paris began to pivot toward the modern age. If you're interested in Impressionism and post-Impressionist works of art, consider a visit to Brant Roberts Galleries in the Short North. The Fine Art Gallery carries a selection of historic paintings by 19th and 20th century artists. Check them out online at brantrobertsgalleries.com. Now let's meet a Texas-based artist whose method of photography is all about making a picture rather than taking a picture. There's always a narrative, but it might just be my narrative. There's not a lot of narrative in art these days, and I have a feeling it's because of the World Wide Web <laughs> and 150 television stations and reality shows. There's no stories to put in art that we don't see all day long, a thousand times a day. And that's happened to me. I don't have any stories outside of myself that I feel I need to portray because they're already told, they're not interesting anymore. About 20 years ago, I was asked 
to do some portrait commissions. And I didn't know why I got disinterested in doing narrative work for about 12 years after that. And I finally realized what I, <laughs> what I observed and what I saw in real life in people's homes was way more interesting than what I could make up. And that, that sort of led to, you know, the, the miniature sets, working with drawing, uh, working with IC light without people in it at all, and working with sculptural objects. The yeah, IC light started with a miniature set built on the dimensions of the golden ratio, which is supposedly the most beautiful shape. It's an architectural dimensions. And it was an empty set. And I would stare at it, and then I would take whatever objects I could find in the studio to make something. And it was mostly like, a, it, was, it was actually more of a drawing exercise for me, or an object making exercise. And then what would make it actually work was the type of light that I would apply to that piece. That series of work was really about an artist working in an empty space and lighting it. I work intuitively and with somewhat of a you know, gut feeling or, or a uh, profound feeling. It's the way I look at art. If I see art and I get a emotional response, that's how I also make my work. I'm not really illustrating my emotional state or my feeling, but I'm making something that comes out of that. And there's been times when I'm actually making, like say for instance, the, the, in the series, In the Absence of Others, those figures began because of how I was feeling that day. I was going through a period of a lot of emotional things with, you know, family, career, finance, you name it. And there's always a challenge in each body of work for me. I mean, it's, I, that has to be interesting to begin with. And it has to be somewhat of a learning experience in a way. Uh, in earlier work, say the Real Pictures series, you know, people would respond because there were human beings in it acting out a scene. And it reminded it of something that they had been in. I've always worked with sort of human relations. And yeah, it's an accomplishment if someone had some emotional response instead of just like a visual response of, okay, this is like a sculptural figure that he stuck in the set and took a picture of. It wasn't, but that's a failure. If that's what someone sees, then it failed for them. Doesn't mean it's gonna fail for the next person or for me, but it failed for that person. You make things for people to enjoy um, or not enjoy. I mean, even that's, that's an equally good response if someone hates something, actually, at least it, it caused something um, in them. The reason I chose to use a camera to make my work is because it's the one tool that I can use to combine fantasy and something real, or something made up and something real. Um, I can deal with scales, perspective. It's really hard to explain what my vision is because it does, it's, it's not, again, that's not in a straight line either. And ideas come from all places. When I first began, it was very important to make photographs that were so obviously staged that they were against everything that traditional photography was about. That I am making 
a picture instead of taking a picture. If you could like just think of an idea and it would appear, that'd be great for me. ColumbusMakesArt.com is Central Ohio's most comprehensive source for arts and cultural events. Be sure to check it out to find great things happening around town this week. That's our show. To see all of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're wrapping up today's show with the local sounds of the moving parts and a track off their 2010 album, State Lines. Thanks for watching. We'll bring you more great stories from around Central Ohio next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.